Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you here today on 17th May. This day we celebrate World Telecommunication and Information Society Day, and we truly have a very exciting program for you. Before we kick off our program, we have a few words from the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, video message. It's World Telecommunication and Information Society Day, which also marks the birth of the International Telecommunication Union. I commend the ITU for the critical role it plays in narrowing the digital divide and connecting people wherever they are, whatever that means. As we look to an increasingly digital future, I welcome your focus on exploring how artificial intelligence can accelerate progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals. And I also commend you for inviting pioneer astronauts to share their experiences about tackling new frontiers. They are an inspiration to our efforts to expand opportunities for women and girls in technology. Emerging technologies have the potential to empower people and transform how we transmit knowledge, increase agricultural yields, harvest sustainable and renewable energy, treat diseases, and so much more. Let us keep working together to ensure these technologies serve the global good of all humanity. Thank you. And thank you to Mr. Gutierrez. It's now my great pleasure to introduce the Secretary General of ITU, Mr. Julian Zhao, to tell you all about World Telecommunication and Information Society Day. Mr. Zhao. I think that we still have some seats on the front row. You know, the people in the back can come to the, to the, to the front row here. Excellencies, dear colleagues, today is a very special day for ITU and all our members around the world. Today, we celebrate World Telecommunication and Information Society Day 2018. And our theme this year is enabling the positive use of artificial intelligence for all. IT was born on 17th of May, 1865. ITU has been at the center of advances in communications for over 150 years, with technologies ranging from the telegraph, telephone, the radio, broadcasting, the television, and the satellites, to the internet, mobiles, 4G, 5G, cloud computing, the internet of things, deep space communications, and artificial intelligence. Every year since 1969, ITU members and partners have organized events across the world on 17th of May to recognize and promote the positive role that information and communication technologies can play in our societies and economies. At this ceremony today, we have three special sessions. We will pay tribute to someone who has contributed to the work of ITU over 50 years. And we will celebrate the very first issue of the new ITU journal, ICT Discoveries. But first, we will have a very special program to promote the women in ICT, AI, and space activities. We will have a chance to meet and hear from two female astronauts and one female space explorer. 
ITU and the space have a long and a rich history. We develop, we develop global regulations and standards for radio systems of key importance for Earth observation, climate monitoring, and space missions. We started to allocate radio frequencies for space communications in 1963, just the six years after the inaugural flight of the Sputnik. Without a dedicated spectrum for space missions, how would we communicate with astronauts, with the space, spacecraft? How would we conduct a scientific research? And if we want to see the aircraft, spacecraft, if we want to talk to them, if we want to receive the result of the science programs, we needed to make sure that the spectrum will guarantee all these communication channels. IT has contributed to the success of the space missions, including those conducted by our special guests here with us today. And we are now on the path to open up new opportunities for space activities during our World Telecommunication Conference, World Radio Communication Conference next year. In China, there is a saying, women hold up half of the sky. Valentina Tarashikova, the first woman to fly in the space 55 years ago, once said that a bird cannot fly with one wing only. Human space flight cannot develop any further without the active participation of women. We are pleased to see many women participate in the space missions. Today, we are joined by three extraordinary women. Ms. Liu Yang, the first Chinese woman in the space. <laughs> Mr. Samantha Christofferetti broke the record for the longest space missions ever completed by a woman. She had stayed in the sky. She had stayed in the sky for more than a half a year. And our moderator, Anoshe Ansari, is the first female private space explorer. I also want to pay special tribute to another female astronaut, Yalina Konakuva, who was the very first woman to enter the cosmonaut program with the male classmates in Russia. Actually, she traveled to Switzerland yesterday. But unfortunately, today, for some special reasons, she could not join us. We also thank her for uh, enthusiastic uh, agreement to join us today, but uh, for very special reasons. Unfortunately, at the last minute, she could not come to this stage. This woman show us that math, science, engineering, and technology can make you rich for the stars. But uh, that's not all. And we reflect on this potential of uh, artificial intelligence to accelerate the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
our special guest can shed new light on the meaning of artificial intelligence and tech for good and for everyone, in particular for women and girls. So please join me in welcoming three of our finest space explorers and tech advocates, Liu Yang, Samata Christoforetti, and Anasius Ansari. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for uh, this special um, session. And it's my privilege to have two wonderful colleagues here on stage that will share their experience and stories with you. Um, we're going to start with a quick presentation, and I'll share a little bit of my story and how I became interested in space and my wonderful experience of flying to International Space Station. And then we'll hear from uh, our colleagues here. So can I have the presentation? Great. So um, I was uh, born a long, long time ago in a country far, far away in Iran. Um, I grew up actually with uh, you know, this passion and vision of going to space. I fell in love with the stars at a very young age. And all I wanted to do is become an astronaut. I even drew this picture, showed it to everyone around the house. And I told them, this is how I'm going to go to space. And of course, as you can imagine, a young girl in Iran, no space program, nobody believed me. But uh, I like to show people that they're wrong about me all the time. So not only I had to go to space, I had to go in a rocket that resembled my drawing. So uh, you can see that how I was able to predict the future. Um, I believe in imagination. I think human beings have this amazing um, gift that is very unique to us, and that's our imagination. And that's what allows us to actually create things that do not exist, um, you know, create places, invent things. And it all starts with a spark of an idea we get, and it may be an inspiration we got by seeing something outside or watching it on something on TV. I was a Trekkie. I loved science fiction books. And soon enough, you see yourself in those you know, positions, in those heroes um, you know, in the book, and then you can make it come true. I um, came to US when I was 16 years old. I didn't speak English, didn't have any money, but I knew I wanted to become an astronaut. And uh, I found out that it's not going to be possible for me. I wasn't even a US citizen. And um, so I took a different path, became an electrical engineer, became an, became an entrepreneur. Eventually, many years later, sold my company and uh, uh, became involved with a project to make my vision happen. Because when I looked around um, for the, stars, uh, for the uh, Starfleet Academy, uh, there was no Starfleet Academy. Uh, a long time had gone uh, since the first endeavors of Yuri Gagarin to, to, to space, but um, the space was not open to the public still. There was no Starship Enterprise to take me to galaxies far, far away. So um, I decided that I'm going to do something about it. So when we sold our company, I had the privilege of meeting an amazing individual called Peter Diamandis, who had this vision and a dream of a competition, a competition that would ignite you know, innovation in space and open it up to everyone, democratize it. And that was the XPRIZE Foundation. And um, I became a partner in this endeavor with him and became the title sponsor of the Ansari XPRIZE. And that was the first XPRIZE launched. It was a $10 million prize to um, open up space for everyone. And it was uh, to reach the edge of space, about 100 kilometers and do it twice within two weeks. Um, there were 26 teams that competed for this $10 million prize, and over $100 million was spent to win this $10 million. 
So we figured that, you know, this is a fantastic idea and it worked in space, it could work in other places. And not only it worked, but uh, it worked in uh, manners that we never uh, imagined. And right at the time when the prize was won, Richard Branson stepped up and uh, turned it into a business. Virgin Galactic was launched. And I believe maybe even this year, because they've done their successful test flights, uh, we will have the first commercial passengers uh, experiencing um, the flight to edge of space. Uh, because of a lot of regulatory changes, policies that we changed, and the awareness we created, a hundred billion dollar industry was um, generated. And you have companies like SpaceX or Blue Origin right now that are uh, becoming partners with the um, government space agencies and really um, advancing um, innovation in space uh, much faster than it has ever uh, been seen before. Uh, we didn't stop at the Ansari X Prize. We have another prize related, um, space-related prize that's ongoing, the Google Lunar X Prize. Um, uh, even though uh, the Google uh, sponsorship ended uh, just a few months back, uh, because there was so much excitement in the teams, we are continuing the Google Lunar X Prize and it will become just a Lunar X Prize for us uh, that uh, would allow other sponsors to step in. But uh, until then, it is actually ongoing and the teams are continuing to build um, their uh, uh, rovers for a uh, moon landing. And we're very excited about the technologies that were developed for this prize. And um, we are very, very proud to uh, announce a, a very recent partnership with NASA uh, and NASA's, NASA's Frontiers Development Lab in a collaboration in looking at prizes around space resources. And you can learn about this at the uh, NASA Frontiers Development Lab website. Is this okay? Good. I'll, I'll do a private session for you later. <laughs> in Chinese. In Chinese. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, we've been talking about AI and exponential technologies. Uh, we had um, our colleagues that talked on the trust uh, in AI um, track. And a lot of these conversations around technology, sometimes um, outside of these walls especially, creates fear because it's something we don't understand. And human beings' um, natural response to new things and things we don't understand and we cannot predict is fear. But the reason we're here and we're having a session on AI for good is to actually overcome those fears and not allow fears to drive our decisions, but actually let hope drive our decisions. And that's why we want to use AI technology, use space technology, use everything at our disposal to create a beautiful future. And with everything at our fingertip, I think that's possible. And it's just, we need to use our imagination and that's why we, we are here uh, today. And uh, I'm especially here today because I want to see a lot more young girls entering the field of technology and, and STEM and become engineers, become astronauts, people like Haga, who's a, who's a Syrian refugee who dreams of going to space. And I hope one day her dream will come true. So I'd like to share with you a video that takes you on a journey to space with me, and then I will pass the baton to my colleagues. Stars twinkle. Uh, it was something that well, I wanted to experience for myself. The mystery and the unknown out there always have been drawing me to space. The universe is calling me. So this is the winning of the X Prize um, flight. Ansari, the title sponsor of the Ansari X Prize. Congratulations on today's flight. Uh, I'm not afraid of risk. This is a risk worth taking. And having the view we saw today on the monitors of Spaceship One, just an experience that's out of this world, and I would do anything, give my life to experience it. So uh, when you fly on the Soyuz, um, they make a seat liner that casts it to your body. So this is um, the Leonardo da Vinci of the cosmonaut program casting this. This is the centrifuge training area. 
zero G flight. Actually, I had family members who came and joined me on one flight. These are my crewmates uh, when we were getting ready for a final exam. Um, Mikhail Turin was the Russian cosmonaut on this mission, and Michael Lopez Alegria was the NASA astronaut that accompanied me. This is the morning of the flight. So after going through the preparation, you board the bus and um, you actually go to the to uh, rocket and then ride a small elevator to the top to where the capsule is. We were just reminiscing about it, you know, coming down the elevator here. Um, It was a very difficult experience for for my family and all the astronauts' family to see their loved one um, go on these missions, but um, they are all very supportive uh, in every aspect of the world. So on my mission, it, take, it took two days uh, in the capsule to dock to the space station, and this is the docking, actually. There were three crewmates waiting for us, uh, making us uh, feel at home. For the first time, I will see the Earth as a really beautiful, glowing blue globe in the background of the universe. One fun fact about being in space is that because you're floating around, there is no concept of the ceiling or a floor. So you see equipment all over and uh, as you change your orientation, the floor becomes the ceiling and vice versa. Uh, this is my sleeping bag right here, right by the best view from the world. The views from space station is amazing. From up here, Everything's really peaceful and you can't see the borders, you can't see different race, different religions. All you see is just one earth, uh, very peaceful and beautiful rotating. And I think that's part of the reason I wish more and more people will be able to experience this firsthand because talking to the astronauts and cosmonauts, they have a different perspective on life and how important it is for us to do everything in our power to preserve the only home we have uh, in the universe. So thank you very much. So um, please. Uh, so we. Um, so we have uh, Ms. Liu Yang, um, who is the first um, Chinese um, uh, astronaut, uh, female astronaut who uh, flew to international uh, to um, the um, Chinese space station. And also she's a pilot, a major in Air Force, and uh, we're so lucky to have her here with us. Liu. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Liu Yang, a technaut. It's my great honor to attend this conference and share my outer space experience. 
six years ago, Xinjiang 9 spaceship, which was developed by China, was launched with three crewmates aboard, including me. It's the first time that we performed manual rendezvous and docking. It's also the first time that we entered Tiangong Wan. Thus, we started a meaningful and memorable tour of space exploration. About 10 minutes after liftoff, the rocket sent us to the scheduled orbit. I'm sure I will never forget this long, long 10 minutes featured the expectations and excitement. Though I have been well prepared and imagined a thousand times the image of space, I was still greatly astonished. I can hardly describe its beauty because words fail to express how beautiful and miraculous it is. The bodiless space tells me what brightness and infinity is. Looking back on the Earth from 340 kilometers away, the planet where human and other creatures have lived for millions of years looks so glamorous. I saw the oceans with deep, shallow blue. I saw the clean contour of the land and the long coastline. This is our beloved homeland, Earth. She deserves our love, cherish, and protection. Sure, the beauty of our planet is quite beyond words. These photos and videos were taken in space. It's funny to share that at my first sight of the Earth from space, I couldn't help shouting, look, the Earth is round indeed. The unique microgravity environment not only challenges our space tolerance, but also brings a unique experience in meantime. Without constraints of gravity, I felt like a free fish swimming in the ocean of space. Microgravity set all the things free. They seemed alive, floating and flying. In Chinese fairy tales, we have an omnipotent monkey king who can travel 108,000 li with a single somersault. During my flight, I had a dream in which I transformed myself into the monkey king, flying in the clouds, turning a somersault freely. That was amazing. Human exploration of space has never stopped since 1961. However, we should note that space activities are still highly risky. Thanks to the rapid development of artificial intelligence, we can anticipate that AI astronauts could be very helpful in future human space flight missions. Anyway, human astronauts will never be replaced since they are still the essence of human space flight. We firmly believe that the essence of human space explorations will be significantly improved with the assistance of AI astronauts. Space exploration will never stop since human spirits of exploration never come to an end. We are delighted to see more females join us and play a vital role in the exploration of the universe. We will always be expecting we step further into deeper space with astronauts and scientists from all over the world, men and women. It has been placed on the agenda in China to build a new space station around 2022. We have started the selection of new technos. We are looking forward to a closer cooperation with international experts in our space station. Welcome. Thank you.
Thank you, Liu. Um, now I'd like to invite Ms. Uh, Cristoforetti to join us. She is the first uh, female Italian astronaut uh, who flew to International Space Station, as you heard, uh, with a 200-day record of uh, being in space. Samantha. Thank you, Anusha. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary General, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be on, uh, on this panel. I know we do not have much time, so um, I will make use of my privilege of being the last speaker to be extremely brief because the two ladies who spoke before me have so eloquently already expressed many of the things. Uh, that, of course, I have experienced and, and felt as, um, in my astronaut career as well. Uh, it's really funny. I don't know if I ever told Anusha this story, but uh, um, several years ago, I read her book. So Anusha is also an author. Uh, my Dream of Stars, I believe, is also the, author, uh, the, the name of the memoir. And so she was telling her story that she briefly outlined today in more detail about her upbringing in Iran and all her life story. But especially when it came to her childhood in Iran, all the time, you know, every page I was like, oh my gosh, me too, me too, the same for me, it's me too. <laughs> so it was so funny how, you know, I grew up in Italy and she grew up in Iran, but somehow our childhoods were so similar. It, it's, uh, it was an amazing experience. Um, so yeah, I, I gave that away already. I'm, uh, uh, I'm a European Space Agency astronaut um, of uh, Italian nationalities. So I, I was born, uh, I went to school, grew up in, uh, in Italy in this uh, tiny little village with a beautiful night uh, sky with uh, no light pollution. So the sky was a very powerful presence. Like Anusha, grew up as a, as a Trekkie, as a science fiction uh, fan, um, very adventurous child and, uh, and wanted to go to space. Um, I have to say, in my case, I, I was never told I couldn't, to be honest, uh, and I never had any doubt that I could. I mean, I, I knew that it was going to take a lot of luck, because uh, there's very few people becoming astronauts in, in Europe in a generation. In my generation, it was six all over Europe. So it takes a lot of uh, very fortunate circumstances. But I think I'm one of those uh, uh, girls and, and young ladies who were actually never told that they couldn't do what they wanted. So I, I was pretty confident that, uh, that if the circumstances allowed it, I, I, I would be able to do it. Um, my path went uh, also through engineering studies. Uh, I studied um, mechanical and then aerospace engineering at the University of Munich. Uh, so I chose from the very beginning to have quite an international education. Uh, during my university studies, I also spent time in uh, France and uh, Moscow. Of course, I knew that uh, uh, the, the Russians, Russian friends are, are a major partner in the International Space Station. So it wasn't by chance, of course, that I chose to go to Moscow to do my thesis. I spent a year there. Um, then I, I had a chance to um, come back to Italy and join the Air Force. And uh, I became a combat pilot for the Italian Air Force. I was at the very beginning of my operational career when this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity came up to participate in the um, astronaut selection of the European Space Agency. And uh, so became an astronaut in 2009, uh, together with five um, other colleagues of diverse backgrounds. You don't have to be in the military, you don't have to be a pilot. Uh, some of my colleagues, uh, three of my colleagues uh, are civilians, were and are civilians. Uh, a couple of them had no flying experience at all. One a pure scientist, another a pure engineer. So there's opportunities for uh, very diverse uh, backgrounds uh, in, uh, in the field. Um, and then I started to training. I trained for, uh, trained for uh, several years around the world. I, also, I always had a suitcase packed. I spent a lot of time in uh, airports because uh, when you're assigned to a mission to the International Space Station, uh, we call it like that for a reason. Uh, it's this amazing infrastructure in low Earth orbit. It's as big as a football field, and it's basically this big laboratory where you can do research in microgravity, which is just a fancy word to say that you're weightless and things float. Uh, and that's very interested for a number of uh, scientific research disciplines in, in physical sciences as well as in uh, life sciences. And so it's called international because it's the product of a big partnership uh, between uh, a different space agency. Of course, NASA and Russia are the major partners. 
but we, um, as uh, Europeans, uh, um, have a major contribution, uh, both to the European Space Agency and in some cases also through, also through bilateral contributions of um, single countries, like my country, Italy, is very, very active in, uh, in that sense. Um, and of course, we have the Canadians and the uh, Japanese. And so when you're an astronaut in training, you're basically going to all, different, all those different places all the time. Like you might be three weeks in Houston and two weeks in Russia and one week in Japan, and uh, you're bouncing around the continents um, for about two and a half years. And then finally, uh, for me also that moment that uh, Anusha showed in her beautiful video came about, which was the launch from the cosmodrome of, uh, Kazakh of um, Baikonur in Kazakhstan to the International Space Station. I was up there quite a long time. Rotations are typically uh, five and a half months. And then when we were getting close to our uh, return, uh, there was an accident of a progress resupply ship. It's a little bit counterintuitive. You would imagine a cargo ship doesn't come, so you don't have supplies, so you have to come back earlier. In our case, because of the way things played out, we actually had to stay a month uh, longer, which I thought was great. Uh, and so we ended up staying uh, uh, almost seven months on uh, space station, uh, doing a number of uh, scientific investigations. There's typically on ISS about 200 scientific investigations in one uh, what we call long duration mission. Uh, I supported spacewalks. I was at the controls of the robotic arm. Um, you know, it's, it, it's physically what, uh, what uh, astronauts do in the, in the ISS world. We're a little bit all jack, jacks of all trade. We're uh, only six up there. Um, the, the Russian colleagues, three, uh, take care mainly of the Russian operations on board and all the um, American Europeans, Japanese, Canadians, we take care of the rest of the station, and we kind of have to be able to do everything. That's why the, the training is, uh, is so long. I look forward, of course, to go back to station eventually, probably sometimes in early the next uh, decade. Uh, it will be my turn again. We're planning to operate space station uh, at least until 2024, maybe uh, even further beyond that. But we are also looking uh, into uh, what we called beyond low Earth orbit exploration missions. So that will be in a first step, uh, building a habitat, like a small space station, uh, in a very peculiar orbit around uh, the moon, uh, which will allow us to uh, test uh, our technologies and also our operational concepts uh, for missions which are not so close to home. Space Station is only 400 kilometers, so it's, it's very close. We have robust concepts there, we have robust technologies, but when you go further away, uh, things become a little bit more complicated. And then habitat, uh, the orbit of that habitat is chosen in a way that it provides a relatively easy access to the moon's surface, so that would be the next step. And then eventually after that, but then it's a little bit, or quite a bit more long term, onto Mars. So artificial intelligence will be instrumental for, for all of that. Um, of course, AI is pervasive in everything we do in, in space nowadays, and uh, I think many of the tracks that were presented today uh, were proposing projects that rely heavily also on, uh, on uh, satellite data. Uh, so, of course, uh, ESA, European Space Agency, is very interested in leveraging the potential of AI to make that data more useful. You know, we have a number of uh, Earth observation platforms on orbit within the Coper Copernicus program, um, and it's obviously of, of interest to have a, a system that, in an intelligent way, is able to fuse all that data and make it uh, usable for uh, different applications for European and world uh, citizens. But at the same time, if I talk about things that are very close to my heart, which is, uh, of course, uh, human exploration of uh, space, AI is, uh, is going to be extremely important for that as well, because we all understand that a lot of the human mission, especially on the surface, we're talking moon surface, Mars surface, are going to be preceded by what we call robotic precursor missions. So um, autonomous robotics, uh, autonomous navigation, even the ability of uh, a moon uh, surface rover to autonomously, intelligently pick a route, pick a sample, which is interesting from a, a geo geological uh, scientific investigation point of view. All of that will be um, extremely instrumental in, uh, in making uh, space exploration uh, effective and affordable. 
Sometimes people ask me, why haven't we done that before? We went to the moon 50 years ago. Why are we talking now about maybe getting back in the next decade? It's not really that much of a question of technology. It's a question of the price tag and, and all the political implications that go with uh, expensive programs. So the more we can leverage technology, and again, AI is going to be key in that to make those programs uh, efficient and affordable, the more likely it is that they will actually happen. Thank you very much. Great. So um, I have a few questions that I'm going to get started on, and then we'll invite the audience for a few questions as well. So Liu, let me start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about what inspired you to become an astronaut and what challenges you faced when you were on space station, on your space station. Uh, I think我在成为航天员之前其实是因为宇宙的浩瀚无比有太多太多的好奇我想去揭开宇宙神秘的面纱想去看一看在那浩瀚无垠的宇宙里面到底是个什么样的所以就是这个梦想一直激励着我成为了一名航天员 Thank you um, Samantha, um, there are uh, many people in this audience that I know of uh, that uh, want to become an astronaut and also outside these doors, many, many. And as you said, it's a difficult process. Can you tell us what would uh, increase our chances or the, um, especially young women out there that also want to join um, the astronaut program, what would increase their chances? Um. Uh, there's no, I mean, I'm, I'm, at least I'm not aware of any special um, recommendations specifically for, uh, for women. The path is really the, the same for, uh, for everyone. Um, again, things change fast, and uh, we are in a very dynamic environment now when it comes to access to space, especially low Earth orbit. There's a lot of uh, companies in, in the US, and uh, Anusha has mentioned some of them, who um, hope to be able to offer in the near future at least uh, suborbital flights, but actually some of them are also looking into commercially available um, orbital flights and, and potentially even building platforms in, uh, in uh, low Earth orbit which are sold on the market. Now, I have no idea whether that makes sense from a business perspective. It's completely out of my um, uh, field of expertise. Uh, probably Anusha no, knows more. Uh, but that, that might come. And so the opportunities to go to space uh, will, you know, will multiply, will be uh, many, many more. Um, and the, the, the type of uh, you know, professional profiles that are sought after might not even be the same. So I, I think it's an exciting time where um, opportunities will multiply to, to go to space, or at least there's a chance that that, that will happen. If we're talking, let's say, the, the traditional uh, astronaut hired by a space agency to, you know, to, to be a professional astronaut for a certain number of years and, and, and have a career in that way, Typically, there's two uh, fields where we recruit, which, were, which are the, the uh, STEM, let's say, science, uh, engineering, technology, math, uh, also medicine background, and the um, aviation background, so pilots. Um, or you can have a mix of the two. In my case, I, I, I mixed. I studied engineering, then went on to uh, become a combat pilot, but had a, quite a short career in that. If you go straight to become a pilot, then of course it's expected that you have a, a longer career in that, become a test pilot, and uh, you know, and, 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 and can show a strong aviation background. Or some people have a pure um, um, engineering and science background. What I will say to the people who chose the latter, so maybe become scientists, really good scientists, really good engineers, and have that dream of become astronauts, I would try to add to the curriculum something which I would call operational, something that shows the recruiters that you are comfortable also outside of your lab or outside of working in front of a computer, uh, because that's really important. And I'll give you two examples. The two colleagues of mine selected in 2009 who were not pilots, 
uh, one of them is a scientist and he had in his background, well, it basically, you know, when, when a volcano explodes and people start running away from the volcano, he starts running towards the volcano because he, he's like a, he was a geophysicist and, and studies. So he had that in his background. He had a, num a number of expeditions in Antarctica. And Antarctica bases, of course, are considered a classic analog of, uh, of spaceflight. The other one, a pure engineer with a PhD in engineering, but had spent a number of years on oil platforms, offshore oil platforms. Again, a confined environment, potentially dangerous. You have to go to a number, you have to you know, s follow certain procedures. You have to be able to work with people that are there with you, you know, the, there's no escape. So again, very similar to spaceflight. So if you, if you don't want to go in aviation, you're gonna go in science and engineering, find something like that to do that shows that you are capable of handling yourself in environments like that. Otherwise, the recruiters will not be able to say whether you can be trusted in such an environment or not. Thank you, Samantha. So if you're a researcher out there, just go find something really, really dangerous and adventurous to do. <laughs> Um, Leo, um, let me ask you, um, when you went on your space uh, trip, what did you find surprising? What was challenging for you? Uh,我想最让我感到惊奇的就是我刚才在五分钟的演讲中说的,就是第一次回望地球的时候,那个时候你会有真正的大和小的这种深刻的体会,而且会非常的震撼,你会觉得地球 它就是一个我们人类共同的家园，但是我们在太空上，大家看到航天员都是非常呃非常轻松的一面。其实要成为一名航天员，适应太空这种失重的环境呢，对人的挑战还是非常非常大的。嗯，大家都知道航天员进入
And so there, there's been a convergence about uh, uh, building this uh, habitat I discussed about. For a long time it was called Deep Space Gateway. I think now they, they, they changed the name. It might change again. It doesn't matter. Um, but there are very concrete uh, uh, studies now out there to, uh, to define the architecture of the first modules of this, uh, of this habitat, which will, you know, it will have a sort of like a service module. They call it a power and propulsion module, and then probably an intermediate uh, um, a small module for to, to for edit capabilities and then a habitation module. So it will be very small, not like the, the space station uh, uh, right now, but uh, it will be a start. Um, and as I said, it, it will be on this uh, very highly elliptical orbit around the moon. Um, it's but it's going to take about seven days to go around the moon, and on one side uh, it's going to come really close to the moon's surface, so a, a very perfect place to, uh, to land. Um, technologies, I mean, well, uh, of course, and uh, it, it, it's really, I, I can't stop saying that. I mean, uh, to me, a sustainable space program, it comes really down to affordability and make it sustainable from uh, an economic, from a budget point of view. So, of course, reducing the cost of access to orbit is uh, extremely important. Reusability of rockets has become the, this, this, new, uh, this new hype, and uh, just a few years ago, people thought it was actually impossible. Um, and now, of course, uh, history has shown that it is possible. And I think a lot of uh, uh, computational techniques from the artificial intelligence toolkit have been instrumental in allowing the, this uh, rocket stages to actually fly themselves Back to the uh, or back to Earth or to uh, or to the ocean, uh, and and basically pinpoint the the, the landing like uh, like that because of course they they have to be able to react to unexpected atmospheric conditions and, and that you can only do with uh, uh, with artificial intelligence techniques. Um, uh, generally speaking, when we talk about uh, exploring and going. Further, further out, right? Not space station. So on space station, we talk almost like on a Skype call. Uh, it's very close, so the, the delay is, is very small. If we're talking about the surface of the moon, of course, it's already different. We're talking about more significant delays. If you're trying to control the real time a rover, like navigating it around, like on a video game from Earth, it becomes complicated because the delay starts to become starts to have an impact. If you're talking about Mars, then even more so. I mean, that would be completely uh, impossible. So autonomous navigation is going to be very important, again, uh, very much out of the um, AI um, toolkit. Um, if we're talking about long missions, you need to be able to have technology which is extremely robust, a lot more robust than we have on Space Station now. On Space Station now, we have this privilege of having a lot of space, so we have spare parts for everything, spare units. It's not going to work on a small habitat or on a small spacecraft to, to Mars, and so we have to find new solutions. New manufacturing solutions, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, one of the other things that there's a lot of hype about, of course, is uh, additive manufacturing. The fact that you don't have to bring um, all of your spare parts, uh, you might be able to just send a file and, and print it on need. Uh, and just have the, the raw material, and even maybe be able to recycle the raw material, you know, once you're done using that and, and reuse it. So that's one of the things that we look into. In situ resource utilization, when you talk about surface missions on the moon or on Mars, um, one of the key questions is, how much can we actually get from the land, you know, living off the land? How much can we get from this regolith, which seems like a simple sand, but actually if you start looking into it, it, it has in it resources that could be potentially harvested. And again, it's a matter of uh, technological development, of surveying the sites, of course, of understanding exactly what, what's available, and then, of course, of the extraction um, technologies. Then, of course, there is the big topic of autonomy. I mean, you, you need to be able to take much more autonomous decisions. Uh, right now, everything is, you know, space station is, is flown from the ground. You know, everything, every decision that affects the spacecraft is taken on the ground by flight controllers. Um, astronauts will have to be a lot more autonomous uh, for deep space missions. Uh, so they will need to, to be able to leverage the intelligence of uh, artificial intelligence systems to help them make decisions and, of course, to automate the decisions. I mean, the vehicle needs to be intelligent. It needs to perceive whether, I don't know, we're going towards a failure, whether something is progressing towards an off-nominal situation and take automatic actions. Thank you. Um, uh, yes. 
我们载人航天任务的空间合作呢，我想补充一点：二零二二年，我们中国要建造一个新的空间站，但更像是我们为大家搭建了一个在太空中的一个公共平台。我们非常欢迎和世界各国其他的航天员、其他的专家来进行合作。就比如 Samantha 他们去年曾经到我们中国进行了训练。他们在积极的学习中文，我们也在积极的学习英文，用我们的真诚、开放和合作的态度去欢迎大家，共同加入我们中国的空间站。谢谢。Oh, thank you. I, I may actually, sign up to go. Yeah, we actually trade, not not, to, um, but uh, last year for the first time. Uh, non taikonauts uh, trained with taikonauts in China. Uh, um, a German colleague of mine, Matthias Maurer, and myself, we actually uh, went to China and did uh, sea survival training with, uh, I believe, uh, 12 or 15, I forgot, uh, uh, Chinese taikonauts. So that was a, a very, very big step, I think, towards uh, cooperation. And who knows, maybe one day flying on the Chinese space station. Yeah, I, I look <laughs> forward to that. 而且我们现在也正在积极的推动为其他的国家培养新的航天员这样的计划。That's wonderful. So we have just a couple of minutes left. Maybe one or two questions from the floor. And if you don't have question, I have one last question. Oh, right there. Yes, the lady in the back. You have to turn on your mic. I want to ask question to Liu Yang. 哎，你刘洋，您好，我知道您是中国首位女航员，然后也是世界上少有的女航员。可能一开始被您的家人和朋友，甚至外界认为是一件很冒险的事情，可能一开始会受到外界的质疑。但您的故事激励了很多女性被认世人认为去做不敢做的事情。那么，对于这些想要去做被但是被世界认为不可能的事情，那您有什么建议去对这些女性去面对这些争议呢？呃，其实我认为，只要你选择了，你就要忠于自己的梦想，不要被外界所干扰。你要看到自己的目标，看到自己的梦梦想，你心能到达的地方，只要你够坚持，只要你够勇敢，只要你够执着，只要你够热爱，就一定能够实现自己的梦想，达成自己的目标。谢谢。啊，谢谢。Um, any other questions? Yes. Second, some, yes, thank you. This was very inspiring and uh, very in interesting for all of us. Um, what I would like to ask is you have been very much uh, excited to go there. What was the excitement to go back? What was the feeling when you have to go back? I was very depressed and I didn't want to come back, <laughs> but I don't know about these ladies. <laughs> oh, did, how did you feel coming back? Oh, well, it was similar for me. I mean, I, I've been up there for, for a long time, but still, um, it's not, I mean, it, 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 it's hard to come back, but to be very pragmatic, it's also for very simple, pragmatic reasons, which are, in the end, you get used to life up there. It's a beautiful life. It's, in a way, a very simple life. You know, you're, you're in a confined environment. You know every day exactly what to do because somebody else is going to plan your schedule. And you're perfectly trained to do everything that you're asked to do, which in our normal life, it's not like that, right? You, you know, life is unpredictable, life is complex, life entails a lot of interactions, and you're never perfectly trained to do everything that you're asked to do in real life. So if I have to be honest, I think, okay, part of it was like leaving space and the beautiful view from the window and that. And part of it was just this... I don't want to go back to this complex real life on the ground. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, we're out of time, but uh, it was such a privilege to be on this panel with all of you, and thank you for joining us uh, on this panel. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Zhang. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my great pleasure to invite Mr. Hulin Zhao to present our extraordinary space travelers with the WTISD award. Mr. Zhao, would you please present 
the WTISD award to Ms. Anouche Ansari. Ms. Duzao, would you please present the award to Ms. Yu Yang. <laughs> and the final award to Ms. Samantha Cristoforetti. And if I can just ask the ladies to join Mr. Zhao, we do a nice group photo. This award for World Telecommunication Information Society Day is in recognition of the incredible dedication and outstanding contribution in the pursuit of space exploration and to the advancement of technology in the service of humanity. Congratulations. It is my pleasure to now invite a gentleman who has made an extraordinary contribution to the world of ITU and telecommunications. Without him, according to Mr. Zhao, the sky would fall, as the gentlemen are obviously holding up the other half. Dr. Marko Jagodzic, please join us on the podium. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like now to take a moment to recognize an exceptional individual and someone I'm very proud to call my friend, Dr. Marco Yakudic. Dr. Yakudic started participation in ITU activities in 1968 as representative of the National Telecommunication Industry and Academy in the former CCITT which now become our standardization sector. From the start, his work made a significant impact on the specific needs of developing countries. This led him years later to become a founding member of the advisory board of the Center for Telecommunication Development, which marked the beginning of a new era in ITU's development work and led to the creation of our telecommunication development sector, ITU-D. ITU owes a lot to the dedication and the commitment of Dr. Marco Yakudic, which through its, his involvement with telecom over the last uh, 30 years, or his uh, con constructive uh, role as a delegate at almost all ITU planning potential conferences since Nice in 1989. Dear Marco, you have been a valued and a trusted colleague from those first study groups on transmission system back in 1968 to the telecommunication standardization advisory group where you still serve as a Slovenia representative. You are an example for all of us. You have left your mark on ITU's uh, history. ITU is uh, grateful to you, and uh, through you, 
to the many, many experts all over the world who have uh, strengthened the rule of our organization in its more than 150 years history. Experts like Professor Mark Krivoshev of Russia, who had contributed to IITU's standardization work on radio technologies, in particular TV technologies, since 1948. He's still with us. And IIT was pleased to present uh, Professor Mark Krivoshev our awards two times in recent decade, including the IIT 150th Anniversary Award. And my friend, Mr. Herb Bertin of the United States, who has worked with IIT standardization work since 1976. ITU, ITU Secretary General also offered him a certificate in 2016 for his 40 years contributions, and he is also still with us. IT highly appreciates the contributions made by all experts from all around the world. And so today, I'm very pleased on behalf of the entire IT family to present this medal for 50 years of continuous and fruitful services to one of IT's most distinguished and respected figures. Please join me in giving Dr. Marco Jakudic a big round of applause. This is our gold medal. We did not attribute to this medal to many. And uh, I'm very pleased to present the matter to Marco. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I am really honored to accept this recognition for my <clears throat> long uh, work with ITU, which was a real, not only pleasure, but also a great experience, professional as well as personal. I mean, ITU is really an exceptional worldwide organization which should continue and not only continue, but even maybe more influence the future <clears throat> development of not only telecommunications, but everything related to, to the uh, development of uh, human society and world as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, for the final element of our celebration today, I would like to invite Professor Song of the ITU Journal to join us on the podium. Dear friends, ITU has a new journal. We call it ITU Journal, ICT Discoveries. Because the entire history of ITU is marked by groundbreaking discoveries in communication technology. And because we have helped bring the benefit of these discoveries to millions and millions of people across the world. Our first issue 
is dedicated to artificial intelligence, a new technology that will help us tackle some of the world's biggest challenges. And we investigated the technical, but also social and ethical dimensions of advance in AI. The second issue of the ITU journal, we are turning to data. 2017 itself produced more data than the entire history of humanity. This time, we will be investigating the data dimensions of modern economies and where innovation can ensure that data proves a force for good. I encourage you all to participate. You have until 29 of June to submit your papers. The ITU journal strengthened the bonds of ITU with academia. The very concept of this journal developed out of ITU academia consultations. And there is a new doubt that the long-term vision of academia will help policymakers and industry leaders prepare for the impact of major breakthroughs in research. It has been a long time dream of mine to see this journal become a reality. And so today, I'm very pleased to celebrate this first issue, and I would like to recognize some of the people behind it who are here with us today. Chasab Lee, Director of ITU's Standardization Bureau, which has taken the lead on this project. The ITU Journal's Editor-in-Chief, Professor Song Jian, of Tsinghua University of China, and Associate Editor, Dr. Ruth Kasser of Harvard University. And Stephen Ibraki, the Outreach Chairman of the ITU Journal. Maybe stand up. <laughs> and Professor Os Kasa, maybe stand up, please. Yeah. No, no. That. <laughs> yeah, thank you to all editors and authors, including Professor Thomas Wiergan. And we also, <laughs> he's one of the receiver of five individuals, ITU. Uh, awarded at our celebration of the 150th anniversary for his excellent work on the very famous video coding systems, H264. And nobody can deny that uh, this coding system is a very powerful tool that uh, nobody can use your mobile phone to look at the video messages without this technology. And he's one of the key experts behind that one. Thank you. And also, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Wajik Samek, <laughs> of course, as well as the team ITU staff to support this uh, journal. Please give, give them all a big round of applause. With that, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Professor Song Jian for some remarks. Yeah. No, no. Thank you, Mr. Zhao. I realize I can deliver this speech in Chinese in a very short time, but I can also do that in English without this, but that could take much longer time. Since I realize I'm the only guy standing between you and your lovely lunch, so I'm going to do that in a short time. ITU Secretary General, Mr. Zhao, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. As the Editor-in-Chief, as well as a university professor, it's my great honor and privilege to introduce the progress of the Academia Journal of IC ITU called ICT Discoveries. On behalf of the whole team, we have some gentlemen over there and also a lot of editorial team members sitting around. 
So basically, I also would like to share the experience of this prime example of how ITU and academia are enhancing collaborations to our mutual benefit. Above all, the research community works in service of the public interest, and our main goal is to contribute to social good. Academic and research institutes hope to publish their findings as widely as possible, and we hope to ensure that our work supports social and economic development in a global basis. We share these ideals with the United Nations. In this ITU journal, we see a valuable new opportunity to serve the public interest and make our research known to the public and private sector decision makers worldwide. The first issue of the ITU journal explored how artificial intelligence will influence the communication networks and services. Since there is a rapid developing area, and we will surely revisit this area again in the not distant future. So please stay tuned. As, Professor, uh, as Ms. Zhao mentioned, the second issue of this journal will share a strong bite with the first one and will investigate the data dimensions of modern economies, in particular on how data could act as a force for good. And again, the, the second issue is inviting the submissions until 29th of June. If you go out, you can find a table which has the flyers regarding to the call for papers for this issue. And we're looking forward to receiving contributions from the experts participating in this summit. And please also help disseminate this information among your colleagues in these related areas. Uh, please don't hesitate to stop by for a chat following this session. And I will, I will be glad to share more about these new excite, exciting directions in ITU academia collaboration with you. Thank you all. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived at the end of the World Telecommunication and Information Society Day celebration. I would like to congratulate once again our adventurous ladies. I hope you find this celebration as fascinating as I did, and it's now my great pleasure to invite you all to enjoy a light lunch outside the pop-off room. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you.